All right, so this was mentioned briefly in the general onboarding video, uh, but really going deep here on transactions. Uh, as a transaction coordinator, what do I need to know to keep all of my data straight here to make sure that everything uh, is appearing how it should be? Uh, and then specifically, how do I get into the transaction form? Um, you know, what, how can I make sure that commissions are being assigned and calculated and tracked exactly how they need to be? So. In the general onboarding, and if you haven't watched that, definitely make sure you check that out. Uh, it mentions how I can modify and change all of these fields and I can add in new fields. Uh, but there are certain fields that I wouldn't really want to track in here. An example of that is a transaction fee. Um, yeah, sure, it, it's good to have a transaction fee and actually know and put in how much that transaction fee was. But a better place to track the transaction fee would actually be on the commission form. And the reason for that is transaction fee actually directly impacts the commissions and the income that the brokerage is making. And so I want to track it in the commission form so that it will actually make those changes and reflect on my reporting. So everything that you're looking at here on the commission form is directly affecting my reporting. Um, and so to walk you through one of these, um, how, how this might work and how you can customize this uh, for your specific brokerage, um, the commission form, you want to walk through it top to bottom. So I want to start out with a transaction amount. Now let's say that's $240,000. Uh, gross commission is $6,000, or I could just use this calculator to say 2.6%, uh, or maybe it's 3%. So I have to do a full 3% here. Um, and now this agent paid income is the total amount being paid to all agents on the team. So if I pay one agent 50% here, I would just put 50%. If one agent gets 50% and another agent gets 10%, then I would do 60% here. That's how much all of the agents are getting paid uh, on this deal. So I'll say, let's say in this scenario, my gross commission is 3%. I pay one agent 50% and then I have a sales manager who takes an additional 10% on top of that. And I'll show you how this can be calculated. And let's also say, uh, just to, to show you one that's a little more complicated, let's say that there's a referral coming off the top. So I have this... 25% uh, referral that's being paid out to an outside brokerage who sent us this business. Um, so when I click add here, it's going to pull up the add co commission adjustment. And I have all these different categories that I can create. Um, and with each category, I have an entity that it actually is being paid to. So let me show you. You can click here or I can get there from admin uh, commissions. Uh, I can add in and basically create these different categories based on what kind of commission adjustments uh, my team or my brokerage has. So you can see that I've created a bunch of them here. Uh, one example that I've created uh, is an outside referral. So right here, outside referral. Um, if I click edit, I can show you how I've set it up. So it's just 25%. I don't have a default entity set up. Um, it's not a transaction fee or a cap, so I don't need to worry about this use. So I've set up this outside referral. Um, I can go ahead and use it here. So I'm going to say um, would be outside referral. It's going to be 25%. And by default, it's going to say that this is being paid to other, right? Now I can create different um, entities. So on this on this commission um, form here, this commission uh, setup uh, under admin commissions, I can create these types of um, types of adjustments, and I can also create who they're being paid to. So in this scenario. I've created this entity called referral partner. So I can track how much is going to uh, an example referral partner of ours. So I'll just say that this entity here, rather than just being other, um, I'm gonna say it's going out to our referral partner. And I'll add this in. So now you can see it's taken 25% off the top to get us down to our adjusted GCI. And then it's saying that the brokerage has taken 40% and the agent on this one that's getting paid the 60% uh, is taking 60%. Now, this agent isn't taking that full uh, 60%, so if I want to add a new agent in here, um, I could do that from agent split to get 10% going to my uh, sales manager, for example. But let's say before that, um, out of this adjusted GCI, before agents are paid, I actually have some royalties. Um, let's say I pay, I've, I've gone in and set this up in my entities uh, and in my categories to say that we have a 6% a royalty. And I would have set this up so that this automatically goes to, let's say, to our corporate brokerage, right? The corporate franchise 
franchisor uh, gets 6%. So I'll add that in. And then let's say I also have a 10% uh, local brokerage fee. So I could call this, uh, we'll call this brokerage fee. Uh, it's going to take whatever percent I have it set up to, um, and it might go to my local brokerage, whatever I call that brokerage. All right, so I have these fees coming off the top, which gets me down to adjusted GCI after paying out a referral, after paying out brokerage fees, I'm down to this. Then it's paying 60, 40 out of there. Now I have this other agent on this deal uh, who let's say is a sales manager. So I'm gonna go in and add my sales manager. Um, so this sales manager, um, I'll code it correctly here. Uh, we'll call it director of sales. They're getting paid uh, 10% on this deal. So I could do an amount or I could calculate it based on 10% of paid income. So that's what they're getting paid. Um, I could also do 10% of GCI. So I would just select GCI here and then it would give me 10% of GCI. Right? So I might try that now. Um, we're going to give them 10% of GCI. And we're going to say that it's this agent with uh, sales. Now this dashboard credit, that's explained here. That would be an example of where I actually want the credit for closing this deal to go to multiple agents. So uh, I might have two agents working a deal and I want them to each show up as 50-50 or basically that each of them closed half a deal uh, on their dashboard. For now, I'll just keep this at zero. Uh, I'm not giving this director of sales any credit for having closed this deal. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click add. So now we can see that that uh, additional 10% has come out um, and it's going to this additional agent. So now I've got this breakdown, 10% going to agent one, 50% um, going to this agent and 40% going to this agent and so forth. Now, if the percentages aren't calculating exactly how I need them to be, I can always enter at a bulk amount. It doesn't have to be percentage-based. If your commissions are really uh, intense or different or there's a lot of variables there, um, you can go ahead and just add bulk amounts. I've used the percentage calculators. Uh, if that makes it easier for you, go ahead and do that. Um, now, there might be some post-split adjustments. For example, let's say that the brokerage collects a transaction fee and this comes from the client. Um, I could go ahead and add that in and that's going to increase uh, the amount that the brokerage is making, for example. So there's a lot, lot that can be done here. Uh, I can create any kind of fee. If I'm paying a cap, I could take that out of the agent's pay. Um, I can do all of that. So that's how this commission form works. You really just want to come in and dial in each of these scenarios for yourself. Um, when I hit certify for payment here, all it's going to do is it's going to lock this transaction and make a record of it here. Um, and then this report, this whole thing that I'm seeing here uh, will be reflected in my, uh, in my reporting. So on the team income report, it will show me, this is actually that transaction that we just did. It's gonna show me how much went to the agents, how much went to the company, um, what percentage that is for the company or what percentage they're making. Um, and then I can go into the commission form as well and show uh, where all the commissions are going for a certain time period. So I can see, what I paid out in royalties, what I collected in transaction fees, what each agent has been paid. Um, if there are outside entities, so this corporate or local brokerage examples, um, I can track all that in there. Um, if I paid a referral partner, I can see how much we've sent them this year. So a lot of cool reporting on those commissions. And this all depends, and all of the commission numbers in general depend on having a solid uh, transaction form over here. So that's how the commission form works. If you have any questions, email success at csu.co. Attach like a transaction sheet or an example of, of what you're trying to accomplish as far as, you know, who gets paid what on a deal. So um, you could just send us an example to say, you know, I, I need the brokerage to show this much. I need each agent to show this much. I need our, our broker to show this. I need a referral partner to show this. And we'll show you exactly how we could create that, that, that same scenario We'll actually go in and create it for a transaction in your account so that you can use this as a template. Now, other things that a transaction coordinator should really know, um, most of the time, and this was covered in the general onboarding, but I would say probably uh, a good chunk of the time, an admin or a transaction coordinator is taking care of their tracking transactions when a transaction goes under contract 
and when a transaction closes. So when it goes under contract, they're entering all those commission numbers so that they can be used for reporting and for forecasting. And then when it closes, they're just coming in and marking it closed or verifying that it was marked closed in CSU. So that's kind of where the bulk of the admin work happens. Some admins go back a step and they're actually tracking anything that's active. So signed buyers, signed listings, they're keeping a pipeline of that. They're keeping all the numbers correct. Um, I wanted to offer some support as far as how a transaction coordinator can um, really keep these numbers straight. So one, a lot of transaction coordinators are coming in here and they just go to pending and they're clicking on pendings because these are the deals that they're working with more than anything. Um, you'll notice that on each transaction, I can actually choose to lock it. So if I lock this transaction, only admins or transaction coordinators will be able to edit this data and no one else will be able to. So I can lock it there. Agent will still be able to see it, but they won't be able to edit it. The other thing that's important to understand as a transaction coordinator is that these statuses are driven by dates. So if I'm looking at this dashboard, the way that something uh, accounts into the circle for uh, appointment set is based on one, I have this date range set up. So Jan or December 1st to December 31st. And this is looking at any transaction that has a, an appointment set date, any transaction that's a buyer with an appointment set date over this time period, right? And then this is looking at anything that has an appointment met date over that time period and so forth down to closings, right? Um, and this is looking, this pending right here is actually looking at what's currently pending. So it works a little differently than these numbers. And this is looking at anything that's pending. So when it goes to close, this number will drop down to 26, right? Um, but these dates that have been highlighted orange really are critical to the reporting. So if something has, uh, for example, it has a set date, it has a met date, it has a signed date, um, but it does not have an MLS live date, doesn't have an under contract date, doesn't have any settlement dates, that's gonna show up as signed because it has signed and it hasn't progressed past that, right? Um, so it's just showing up as a signed listing that has not yet hit the MLS. And then I can differentiate and I can say, okay, well, as soon as it hits the MLS, I'm gonna put this MLS live date now it's going to show up in my MLS live listing. So I'll show you a report for this that shows you where, where this is being pulled. But I can differentiate between signed and actually live and active on the MLS. Then I have my under contract date. So once it has an under contract date, now it's going to show up as pending or under contract. Um, and it's going to show up in this and it will show up as pending until it has a settlement date or until it's marked as, as lost. So I can mark transactions as lost. Uh, you'll notice from this previous screen, there's a little drop down. Um, and that's where I can mark something as lost. Uh, but until that is marked, uh, something is going to show up as, for example, if it, if it has all the dates up until under contract date uh, and it does not have a lost date, it's going to show up as pending until I put in that settlement date. Um, the difference between this forecasted close date and the settlement date, they essentially communicate the same thing. But forecasted only works if it's in the future. So if I, if I do this forecasted close date and it's a date in the future, it will actually take this transaction and build it into my forecast. So any report that looks into the future is going to include that. So this income report is an example. You can see that a lot of these transactions are actually in the future because I have my dates set up here to look at the future and I'm seeing some of these that are included in forecasting. So by having a forecasted close date, it's going to build it into those forecasting reports. Now I can do the same thing with settlement date. I can put a future settlement date in here, and that's also going to build it into this report. The difference is, is if I use a future settlement date, as soon as this date rolls around, it's instantly going to convert it to closed, and it will count as a closed transaction. Um, so some people like that automation, and they don't mind maybe coming in later and updating it if, you know, for example, this closing got pushed back or, or canceled for whatever reason. Um, some people would rather use this forecasted closed date uh, and only mark things as closed when an admin manually comes in uh, and logs it as closed. So it's really just a preference thing there. Um, but these dates right here, set, met, signed, MLS live, under contract, forecasted, and settlement, these are really the ones that are driving reporting uh, in the platform and can be used. And specifically these ones that are, are marked as orange. Uh, one more report that's really useful for uh, team admins and transaction coordinators is this active listings and buyers. So this active listings and buyers pulls in everything that's signed and it gives me the option to edit it right from here and it will show me expiration dates and whatnot. 
Um, and then it will differentiate to show me everything that's actually live on the MLS. So it will say, okay, what's signed but has an MLS live date? Um, it has not yet gone under contract or has not yet settled or been marked as lost. So that's what's being pulled into these live listings. Then I've got my pending listings or my under contract listings. So these are listings that do have that under contract date uh, and have not yet closed. So this is kind of my pending inventory. And then I've got my buyers pending inventory. So any buyers that have gone under contract are now showing up in here. So this tends to be a very um, popular and useful report for our transaction coordinators. Um, a lot of other things I can do in here, but I think this video uh, pretty well covers the basics of how to use CSU as a transaction coordinator.